Hello and welcome, my name is Logan and this is where we're going to be breaking down the Blueprint Mesh Transform. We're in part one where we're going to discuss Blueprint Basics, get you familiar with using Blueprints. I'm going to start off in a brand new level. File, new level, or I can use the hotkeys Control N. Just a basic world. And I've already gone and created this folder Blueprints where we have the actual completed Blueprint here and the testing level that we were using in the first video to show the overview. If you were wanting an overview of that, quickly watch that video before starting this part one. If you don't already know this, inside of your uh, content browser, where we have all of our folders, you can actually right click, I can set the color, and I'm gonna make this, uh, go figure, blue for blueprints. Uh, on top of that, I can right click, I can add this to favorites. Now I can twirl down tutorial land and I have our favorites. We are inside of my project tutorial land and now under the favorites we have our blueprints folder. In order to make a blueprint there is a few ways you can do this. The easiest is to right click blueprint class, start with a basic blueprint of an actor and then name it with the prefix bp underscore mesh transform. I already have an asset with this name, which was used in the overview. So I'm going to have an underscore two. And this will be the one that we are starting fresh from. The other way you can make a blueprint is if you already had something inside of the viewport, for example, a basic shape, I have a cube here sitting in the middle and I have the cube selected, then I can go over to this where I can convert selection to blueprint class. Or we can even create a new empty blueprint, which is the same thing that we did inside here in the content browser. The blueprint mesh transform overview was used by making a door with the new modeling tools. So let's go ahead and do that. Select mode, modeling, I'm gonna click on a box, and I already have the dimensions of the door set up here with 100, depth 10, height 200. Drag that into the world and click. Now we've brought one copy in. I'm going to hit complete. You'll notice here we have this line going through there. And that is because under my show, I have collisions being shown. To activate that, you can use Alt C. So we have the mesh that we're going to be using as our test door. I'm going to go back into the select mode. This is the door that we're going to be using as our test mesh, uh, test static mesh. If I go over in the details panel, I can see where it is by clicking browse in content browser. And I'm going to actually hit F2, rename this SM test door, save all. We're going to save this map as our another BP testing level we'll open up our mesh transform and then we'll have a look at what's inside of the blueprint okay this is where you're going to be presented inside of the blueprint we have the three main tabs here the viewport the construction script and the event graph we're going to be focusing a little bit on the viewport and then primarily inside of the event graph where everything happens these are brought in by default on begin play an actor being overlapped and event tick. Begin play refers to when the game starts. Actor being overlapped is when this actor overlaps another actor. And we will be using that. We're not gonna be using this node. Event tick, tick is happening every frame of the game. It is not advisable to have things running off of tick unless you absolutely must. But I do suggest that you use caution if ever using event tick, because this can cause some serious performance issues within your game. In the viewport, on the left-hand side here, you'll notice we have this components tab. When I hit add, I have a list of things that I can add in here. Uh, the common ones, audio, particles, a light, scene node, similar to a null. Uh, if you're familiar with null objects, a skeletal mesh, a static mesh, and some basic geometry. We're going to be starting with a static mesh. Call this just mesh because it's going to be changeable. 
And over here on the right hand side, when we click on an element from the components, we're given the details tab, similar to when you're in the main level and we have our world outliner and then we have our details tab of the object that we have selected. In the details tab here, we brought in a mesh, but we didn't specify what mesh we wanted. So inside of the category static mesh, you'll see that it's none. Now we have created our SM test door, which I'll bring in here. And now we've populated the mesh with our test door. The next thing I want to add is something that when the player overlaps a space near the door, something happens. That something is going to be a collision, a collider. We have a box collision, a capsule collision, and a sphere collision. Okay, here's what a box collision looks like, capsule collision, and then last is the sphere collision. Personally, I enjoy using the sphere collision. So we will have that set up here. Box collision works fine, but I want this to be able to encompass uh, both sides of the mesh and, and all, on, all around the mesh, in fact. Okay, if you just wanna do one side, then perhaps a simple box collision with the box in front of the door would work best for you. You'll notice when I've clicked on the sphere, I then change the sphere radius and we can change that to whatever we like. I want to make sure that the door is completely covered. So when a player comes near this object, we are triggering the actions within here. I'm going to hit F2 and rename this trigger. You'll notice beneath your components, you have this section called my blueprint where we have the event graph. You can double click on that brings us over similar to clicking between the tabs. We also have functions. We won't be covering functions in this series, but that is where you can create uh, a function and use that repeatedly. If you're using the same set of code over and over, it's probably a good idea to create a function that will give you an input and output. A macro is similar to a function, but it is slightly different. Again, we're not going to be covering that in this video as this is a beginner video. The more important tab here that we're going to be talking about is variables. Now you'll notice that we have our components trigger mesh and default scene root, which is the exact same as our trigger mesh and default scene root here. You can also create your own variables and change them to many different types. We will be creating some of our own variables and going over the workflow on that in this video. Now that we have our mesh set up and our trigger, we're going over to the event graph and we are going to be using the begin play and we're going to set up a few initial variables. Okay. Before we start, I just want to let you know that the construction script, when you work inside of the construction script and compile, this will have a live update within your viewport, whereas the event graph is happening at runtime. So because we want to take our mesh and we're going to be creating some animations for the location, rotation, and scale. These are the primary things that we're going to be setting. So inside of here, you'll notice the location is 000, the rotation is 000, and we have a scale of 111. These are the relative transformation properties because they are relative to this blueprint. The default scene root is at position 000. Our mesh, if you'll notice, has a pivot point at the bottom, bottom center, in fact. This will become important as we start to animate and rotate. You know, I'm rotating along the pivot point. If you wanted the door to open from the corner, there are ways to change the pivot, and I will go over that in a later video. Back into the event graph, off of our begin play, we're going to take our mesh, and what we are going to look for is the transformations. We're going to get the relative transformations right here, get relative transformation. Okay. And inside of blueprints, 
when we're getting something, we're getting the details. And when we're setting something, we are going to be setting the details. This will become more apparent as we work through this. Now, you'll notice that I have this orange pin here. And that return value is a transform. Back to the viewport, what is a transform? A transform contains a location, location, rotation, and scale. When I right click on this split struct pin, you'll see I've exposed a location, rotation, and scale. This is exactly what we want. And from here, I want to initialize all of these values as the 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, exactly as they are inside of the viewport with these transform values. And I want to set those up so that I can use them to manipulate them. In order to create a variable, you can go into the variables and hit plus, and I want to use a vector, and this is going to be my location. That's one way, and I prefer to do it in the style where you right-click, promote to variable. Now it automatically creates a return value location, and we have the variable name in here, and I am going to delete this front part and call this initial location. So now we are on begin play, I'm going to drag off that executable into this executable, and I'm setting the initial location. Okay, we have the mesh, we've gotten the relative transformations, and I'm setting the relative transformation, the initial location, to be 0, 0, 0. I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing on the rotational value, right click, promote a variable, and in here, I'm going to change this. I'm going to delete that part and call this initial rotation. And the same thing on the scale, right click, promote to variable. Delete this front part here, initial scale. And now you'll see in our variables area on the left hand side, we have a location, which is a vector, and a rotation, which is a rotator and a scale, which is also a vector. In order for these to be set on begin play, we set the initial location. I'm gonna set the rotation here, and then I'm going to set the scale here. Another handy function is if you double click on a wire, you can create what's called a reroute node. And this is just to make things a little bit cleaner. So we can see that everything is neat and tidy on begin play. We're setting a location, a rotation, and the initial scale of whatever mesh we have inside of the mesh. Right now it is the door. Similar to what we did with the relative transformations, we can right click and promote to a variable here. But before I do that, what I'd actually like to do is split this structure. It's a vector. A vector contains X, Y, and Z. A rotator contains a roll, pitch, and a yaw. And a scale also contains an X, Y, and Z. So I have exposed the values that we're planning on using. These values are going to be manipulated by the artist or game developer. Same thing that we did with the location, rotation, and scale is I'm going to right click, promote to variable, right click, promote to variable, right click, promote to variable. And that way I don't have to go in here and add all these. So they are floats. And in here I'm going to change this to X pause for X position, Y. For Y position, C, for Z position. And then the next thing I'd like to do, if you see this category, it says default, but we can delete that. Call this location changes. Now I've put the Z position and the location changes. I'd also like to set the Y into the location changes and the X into the location changes, as well as my initial location. You'll also notice here, 
this symbol is actually meant to represent a closed eyelid, which means that it is private. When you poke the eye, it opens up. So we're going to poke the eye and we're going to expose the X position, Y position, and Z position. Compile, save. I actually don't need these here, so I'm going to delete those. But I have them set up and initialized. And you can see the default value is zero. And it will not assign a default value until you have compiled. And I'll show you that here. We're going to do the same workflow. Promote to variable. Promote to variable. Promote to variable. Now we have the X, Y, Z, roll, pitch, yaw. And if you look under the default value, please compile the blueprint. I'm going to change this to rotation changes for the category. Rotation changes on the pitch. Rotation changes on the yaw. Click on the initial rotation on the rotator, and I also want that to be in the rotation changes category. Compile. Now when I compile, we are set at default to zero. If I wanted this default to be something else, this is where I would change it. I'm going to poke the eye and expose the roll pitch and yaw. Now I don't need these. I don't need to access them through here. I'm just setting up all of the variables that we're going to be manipulating. Same workflow with the initial scale. Um, if you have trouble seeing things, maybe this isn't close enough for you. If you hold down control, you can zoom in even further. I'm going to right click, promote to variable, promote to variable, promote to variable, into our category, call this scale changes. And I'm actually going to change this to X scale, scale changes, Y scale, scale changes category, Z scale, change the category again, and changing the initial scale category to scale changes. That way I have everything neat and tidy. We have our components, we have our location changes, rotation changes, and our scale changes. I'm going to then poke the eyes on the scale for the X, Y, and Z. Zoom back out. Delete these because we're not using them here. Compile, save. Now I have initialized all of the variables that I want exposed for the artist or game developer. If we go back in here and we grab our, I'm going to delete that mesh, grab our BP mesh transform two, which is the one we're creating from scratch, bring it into the world. You'll see the trigger volume is there. It's in red and we have our mesh. And when we go over in the details panel, these are the categories that we've created, we created the location change, created the rotation change, and we created the scale changes. We expose those variables. Now, you'll see that nothing happens when we change those because we don't have any functionality built into the blueprint yet. So here we have initialized from begin play. When we hit play, we're taking the mesh that we have inside of the viewport, getting the relative transform properties, which are these properties here. And we are initializing the location, the rotation, and the scale. And we have exposed the parameters within the location, rotation, and scale, and created them as variables, which will allow us access to those as we manipulate the blueprint. I'm going to stop this video here. In the next video, we're going to begin setting up the animation for each of the location, rotation, and scale. Thanks for watching. Bye now.